Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Belzer, and I am here today with uh, Alan. Uh, he's the VP of Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. You might have heard of it. It's uh, streaming on uh, Peacock, but you can also catch it in theaters, I believe. Um, but mainly, you can catch it on Peacock if, if you've got a subscription to that. Um, but uh, thank you for joining me, Alan. I, I know we- Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. It's been a long journey to get here. Um, so we've scheduled like what two, three times, and I just been crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, so I've got a ton of questions for you. Um, sure. Because I am so obsessed with the um, visual language of this film. Um, so I I, I want to start out with uh, who you are. Um, I, because I was reading your IMDb page last night uh, doing research and um, there's some interesting projects on there. So I just want to ask, um, what are some of the most important projects that have honed your creative style and you're really proud of? Um, I would say um, I mainly came up through the uh, music video and commercial worlds um, before getting into more long form content. And uh, I would say some of the, the projects that I'm most well known for were um, Lil Dicky music videos um, and Watsky music videos. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, um, then moving into the long form world, um, I, I shot a feature with the McManus brothers. Um, uh, it was called the Block Island Sound. Um, and that one, that one was really special to me um, just being my first feature film, but also shot in my home state of Rhode Island, um, where the directors were also from. So that's um, that's something that uh, that's always stands out as a, a super special project to me. Um, and then I got into uh, doing a lot of um, comedy shorts um, and uh, original content for College Humor and Funny or Die, um, working with Tony Ascenda and Dan Peralt. Um, they were the creators of American Vandal, so I worked on that project with them as well. And then uh, this just this past year, we we ended up doing um, their new show, Players, for uh, Paramount Plus. So it just kind of uh, started off in more short form projects. Um, kind of stayed in that world for about ten years, and then in the past uh, three or four years, been doing uh, more of the long form projects. Yeah, that that's great. Uh, and you know, when I was in. Uh, mentioning the interesting projects it was, it was those watsky and little dicky ones so i was like oh yeah i've watched that music video and thought of how visually inventive is this um in Thank fact you. my my favorite of is it is it one that you've directed um or shot i guess um but um oh what 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 was it it was um his parody of uh inward in paris um his parody of the Kanye song um oh yeah um I forget the name of it off the top of my head his titles are so zany um, um yeah yeah I <laughs> know and I've I've done so many of those videos that um I, I always blank on the names as well um I think at this point I've done um over 30 Watsky music videos I actually went to college with him and then as soon as we were out of school we we started making content together that's awesome um so um, along that same vein, I, I, I always like to, I don't get to talk to cinematographers much. Uh, and I just want to ask, um, for those who are aspiring DPs, what advice would you give to them? I know that's a kind of cliche question, but I always am interested in hearing about it. Um, I think my main piece of advice would be to take every opportunity that you get to shoot. Um, a lot of people um, need to support themselves by doing other jobs, uh, myself included, before I was a full-time DP. Um, getting into the film industry, most likely you're starting at some lower level PA or um, if you're trying to uh, get into a specific department, um, whatever the lowest position in that department is, and then you work your way up. Um, I did that myself. I, I started off as a PA and then was... Uh, instantly trying to get into working with the camera and lighting teams. Um, 
so I started working as a, a camera PA, a camera loader. Um, but anytime I had an opportunity to be a DP, um, whether it was paid or not, I would take that opportunity. And not every single one of those shoots is going to be something that you want to put on your reel or that is going to be um, maybe maybe it's not the the exact type of content that you want to be shooting. But as long as you are doing that position and you're you're behind the camera, um, you're going to learn something from it. And um, it's just going to be another another um, session of practice. So anytime you have an opportunity to, to, to step into the position that you want to do, um, paid or not, do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a really great answer. Um, in fact, I actually have a, um, no, he edits. Sorry. No, that he edits. I keep thinking he does uh, cinematography, but I keep remembering that he edits, um, which is another important job. Um, it kind of creates another kind of, language of, of the film um so let, let's get into the film um sure. so what drew you to honk for jesus save your soul uh, as a dp um uh, i think the main draw for me was um the combination of the documentary style uh mixed with the traditional narrative and having to to tell the story in a way that those two pieces are are separate um, but also coincide and mix at points. So how was that puzzle going to be told? Um, or how was that puzzle going to be fit together? And um, uh, this was Adama's uh, first film, our director Adama Ibo. Um, so I didn't have uh, much reference to go off um, of what she had done going into the project. Um, but we had a, a stellar cast with Sterling and Regina Hall. So um just knowing that they were attached to the project and Adama had written this amazing script um, with uh, two different elements uh, that are styles that I had done in the past, but I had never combined for a single project. Um, it was, it was a, a great challenge for me. So as, as soon as I read the script, I knew it was something that it was new. Um, I had never done it before and it was a challenge that I, I really wanted to try. I'm glad you gave that answer because I actually had a question about the mixing of perspectives. So mm -hmm. I don't know if this is necessarily a spoiler. So, um, but there are points in which the aspect ratio changes. I, I believe for most of the mm -hmm. movie, it is four by three, and then it switches to 16 by nine. So uh, what drove the decision? What were you, or I guess what were you trying to communicate with the differing aspect ratio? Um, I wouldn't say that's a spoiler. Uh, okay. So it's uh, it's it's something that you see right off the bat. Um, and uh, so we have the two different um, aspect ratios. Um, technically there's three, but really we split it up into two. Um, uh, for the documentary style footage, we ended up going with uh, 14 by nine, which is not a oh, okay. ratio that you um the reason we chose that is because the archival sermon footage when you see um lee curtis up on stage like actually giving a sermon uh, at the church that is four by three um that was the native aspect ratio of the um, archival sermon footage that the church provided to us so anytime you see the crowd um full of congregates that was actual footage from their previous sermons because um, we were not able to fill the the entire church with thousands of extras, so that yeah, footage is real real church footage. Um, and then we we shot the reverse with Lee Curtis up on stage, um, and we had about twenty to thirty extras that we could you know sprinkle on the edges to to make it feel like they were attached. But um, that was uh, using their Sony beta cams that the church owned, um, the same cameras that they had shot their sermons with, and that was a native four by three aspect ratio. Um, but we didn't want to do the entire uh, documentary portion in four by three. We felt that was it was a little too much of a jump from the uh, what we were calling cinematic mode, which is the traditional narrative uh, footage, basically anything that is not what the documentary cameras are catching, um, their personal lives behind the documentary. Um, so for the 
the traditional narrative footage, we went with uh, an anamorphic look. Um, we shot with the T-Series anamorphic lenses from Panavision, and uh, that was uh, displayed in a 2-4-0 aspect ratio. Um, okay. And we felt that the 16 by 9 aspect ratio was a little too close to that. So when we were cutting back and forth um, between cinematic and documentary, we felt that 16.9 was a little bit too close to the the 240, um, and we felt that the four by three aspect ratio was a little too far. So we kind of settled in between with a 14 by nine, which was which is not a typical aspect ratio. It's yeah. it's it's really kind of just like in between, um, yeah. but it felt right. It didn't feel like too much of a jump, but you could see the subtle difference. Yeah, I, you know it's funny because it it looks like 16 by nine when you think when you think of it because that's the one you're most accustomed to seeing mm -hmm. uh and just to play with that is fascinating because it creates a hard line between uh what is this and what is that what context are we what filter are we seeing this through mm -hmm. um and, and at first when i wrote down the note when i was uh watching the screener i was like oh, is this like her inner voice or, or, or whatever? But then I was like, then uh, I think 30 minutes go by. And then I'm like, oh, no, no, no. It's, it's, uh, a, it's a different thing. Um, yeah, and, and that, that was the hope. I'm glad that that came across. That was, uh, we knew it was something that um, it's going to take a little while to understand. Um, yeah. it, it goes, cuts back and forth between the two styles early on. Um, and they're a little jarring. But as the, the movie progresses and you understand like what those differences are, then we were hoping basically that it would become um, a subconscious cue that, you know, after the first half hour or so, whenever it switches to those different modes, you just understand what you're looking at. Is it documentary or is it their personal lives? Yeah, and, and it, it's, I, I guess I should it, it mention this, it's like, so Disney Plus has all their IMAX and, um, ratio movies on there uh, through the IMAX Enhanced program. And I think the way you do it, that jarringness is the best way to do it because it instantly snaps the viewer into a thing of, oh, hey, this is different. Whereas when you're watching an IMAX uh, Enhanced thing, it's just like let the ratio slowly expands mm -hmm. like uh, theaters. And I'm like, it works, but then, but you automatically know when that IMAX switches on, it's like, okay, so it, it, it gives you kind of a break in reality almost. Whereas the, the uh, snap in, in the hunk of uh, For Jesus Save Your Soul is much more like, yes, it's a snap of re out of reality, but in a good way, if that makes sense. It's not like a lulling into reality. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But um I hope that made sense. Um but um yeah, it's 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 a fantastic work. Um and so I want to talk camera setup. I I don't know sure. I don't know a ton, but it at certain points it looked like certain broadcasts I've seen from one of my churches and I'm not uh, like it just looks amazing um so can you talk a bit about how you the how you filmed the mockumentary style of the film and setting the cameras up specifically i think there's one scene where it's like camera section a camera is shooting another camera in the same shot and it's and I, I i thought in the moment how is he doing this and not getting the other camera actually in the shot well, we did um, basically how we tried to think of it was the the documentary cameras. Um, they are part of the story. The documentarian is a character in the story. Um, we didn't want to show the documentarian because that was a choice that she was making. She doesn't put herself in her documentaries. Um, she likes to show the uh, the contents. Um, maybe lead with a question every once in a while but for the most part it's a follow documentary that um just just lets the 
the situation B and let's and follows the action. Um, but we were we were thinking of that camera as a character. Um, that documentarian has to make choices. They have to have their own style for the film that they they want to make. Um, but then when it comes to the cinematic mode or the traditional narrative, that's like any other movie where where really the camera doesn't exist. You're you're looking at a story. You're watching a story. But those characters are unaware of a camera or lighting or anything else. It's it's their world, it's their life, um, and those cameras don't exist. Um, so when it comes to, uh, I will try not to spoil it, but there's a there is a scene where we do end up mixing these styles and they come together, um, and it's the first time that we see the documentary physically happening on camera. So the traditional cameras are to, uh, they're they're telling the story of the movie. And at this point, the documentary cameras that are have you've been watching their footage all along, they are now characters in the movie, and you see the camera operators and the boom operator um, in the image. So then, at that point, we're cutting from their footage that is still part of the documentary to the traditional narrative, um, which those cameras technically don't exist in the world because it's it's that's just the movie. Um, so we had to, for that scene specifically, um, this is like the the kind of the climax of the movie. So I don't want to give anything away, but it's uh, um, basically a big confrontation. And um, at that point, we wanted to make it so that we're we're kind of combining the two styles that we've been keeping separate the entire time. Um, documentary style was more handheld and frenetic and uh zooming all over the place with spherical zoom lenses um and then the uh the cinematic look was um more static smooth camera work um with anamorphic lenses and then once we got to this scene where everything is kind of combined we wanted to establish where those documentary cameras are going to be in the scene so when we go to the traditional narrative look you can see them in frame um but then when we cut to those documentary cameras it makes sense for where where they're placed, where that footage is is uh, covering the scene from, and um, at that point, uh, the characters their their entire lives are out on the table. The the kind of the the dirty laundry information that they've been trying to hide from the documentary is now exposed. So it doesn't really matter which camera you're looking at, uh, watching this scene from. Um, it should all be. Um, out in the open and it doesn't matter like which viewpoint you're watching from so we're cutting back and forth between both styles um the cameras that used to be uh, smooth or static are now handheld um and moving around with the characters and um it's kind of the combination of of everything that we had been keeping separate for the entire film up until that point yeah and i think it drops at the exact point it needs to because all the film you're wondering, and again, not getting into spoilers, um, you're all the time you're wondering, okay, what is it? What it? What is the scandal? What is it really about? And then it just uh, shoe drops. Um, mm -hmm. So to see that kind of coalesce into just not just editing, and it just all kind of comes together in a really beautiful moment, um, despite the circumstances course um yeah. <laughs> yeah um and i i guess in that vein um i i just want to ask you know with when we're talking about camera setups and everything did you have to do any research into these uh into production crews of churches or have to go on like research trips or anything like that to kind of find the visual style um uh, for what a church broadcast would look like or anything like that uh, we did. We um, we did watch a lot of references of uh, mega church productions. Um, Adama had a lot of great references. So when I came into the project, she already had like a plethora of of content that I could watch and check out and stuff that she was already leaning towards. And she had um, she had done the short film for this, um, which was then developed into the feature. So she had a a long road of um, content that she had. Uh, been gathering along the way in different styles that she liked pointed out things she didn't like versus things that she did so i i had a <clears throat> excuse me a very clear picture 
um, from her of what she wanted to do. And then from there, uh, we just researched several different megachurch sermons um, and saw how they typically shot those, those types of uh, productions. And on top of that, we were working with the church that we were shooting in, um, and they have an entire uh, production department because they do those these big um, uh, sermon videos and record everything that they do. So um, I was able to talk with uh, Benton, who's their um, head of the media department. He showed us their typical camera positions, um, the reasoning for why they have cameras in certain positions, and then outside of just the camera work, um, what are their typical lighting setups for any given moment throughout a sermon? Um, they have, uh, basically it was like eight to 10, um, pre-recorded lighting setups that they would use throughout, uh, any given sermon. And so we, we checked all those out, um, and used those as a baseline for where we wanted to, to start, um, our lighting, um, uh, we did have to add lighting in and then shape it and um, augment it to, to be what we needed. But I did use um, what the, the church would typically do as a starting point um, in the, the lighting design. Yeah, as a member of a uh, former church uh, production crew, it passed because I was like, oh, I've, <laughs> I've taken that shot before in the little um, crane arm and uh, there, there were just certain things where I was like, "Oh, I've done that move before." Um, so it, yeah, it, it was kind of a visual treat in that way, where I was like, "Oh my goodness, he's doing that thing I do." Um, but luckily, you had way more camera <laughs> cameras than I did. You know, most of the time I was just cl clicking the uh, space bar on ProPresenter, uh, but um, which is what churches <laughs> use for the lower thirds, um, and. Yeah it's just immaculate and um for anyone i i feel like Thank you um i feel like everyone should go stream this movie um because i i think it's one of the most visually inventive movies if not the most inventive movie of the year um obviously uh everything everywhere all at once it still holds a place in my heart but uh, um <laughs> yeah yeah the Daniels but, are great. Actually, I went to college with them, and they're they're amazing. I love I love all their work. Um, but this is up there. I can't remember. I don't have Letterboxd in front of me, so I don't know where it ranks. But it, it's just one of the most inventive movies I've ever seen. And a large part of that, um, other than the story, is the visual style. In fact, actually, just I, you should check out um, see how they run this weekend. Um, I saw that last night um, at, off a screener from Searchlight, and that is uh, as visually inventive as Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. But for, uh, it, there's like split cr cuts where there's like a, one scene happening on the left side, one scene happening on the right side. It's fascinating. But anyways, Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul is now streaming on Peacock. I think it's still in theaters, but if it isn't, just go uh, sign up for Peacock Premium Plus or whatever they're calling it these days. Um, and <laughs> it's pretty cheap. Um, I think it's like $4.99 a month for the ad supported version and $9.99 a month uh, for the ad free version. So that's well worth the price of admission. And Alan, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. I hope to see you again with whatever your next project is. Because I astounding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have uh, uh, um, another project that's current now, um, which if you like Tonk for Jesus, uh, I think you would like this one. It's it's called Players. It's on um, Paramount Plus. It's also in the faux documentary style. Um, it is uh, basically a documentary crew following an esports team um league of legends uh professional gaming team on their road to their first championship um and it's a, a 10 episode series so um if you like the the documentary style or fake documentary style then that's another one to to check out i'll be sure to check it out i also have paramount plus 
Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, with Showtime and all that stuff. So I'll be sure to check it out. But uh, until next time, Alan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.